Stark may be eccentric, but he's got potential. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to exit the donut. I told you, I don't want to join your super secret boy band. Welcome back everyone, this is my full Marvel What If Episode 3 video, What If Earth Lost Its Mightiest Heroes. Very much a Nick Fury episode about him trying, attempting to form the Avengers, but it just going completely sideways. Hopefully he has a backup team, which it kind of seems like he does. There were a whole bunch of easter eggs, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. We're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships, all you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite easter egg or moment from the episode on the video. And careful for spoilers, if you have not seen the episode yet, we'll be talking about everything. I'll number these as we go along, talk about WTF moments and easter eggs, starting with the title, What If Earth Lost Its Mightiest Heroes. So Earth's Mightiest Heroes is what the Avengers were initially called in the comics, it was just part of the title. Marvel even has an animated TV show, mostly aimed at children, that's named that Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. The whole Loki subplot with the episode is actually incidental, like if it wasn't clear, Loki wasn't secretly behind all of this. Tom Hiddleston did come back as Loki and it was fun to hear him come back as this early Marvel Phase 1 version of Loki from the events of the first Thor film. But during the episode, it was Loki mostly taking the easy layup, just seeing an opportunity and taking it like, oh, well okay, this seems easy, why don't I just conquer Earth while I'm here? Turns out it's way easier for him to conquer Earth when the Avengers aren't around. But the episode actually starts with the same what if intro narration from the watcher describing the nature of the multiverse, how nexus events, sudden choices can lead to the creation of many new alternate realities as we're seeing play out across the what if episodes. We just got the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer, everyone's high on Spider-Man fumes right now, I just did a couple videos for it. During that, Spider-Man teams up with Doctor Strange to derp the multiverse, one more day style, but during the What If series, we're actually going to see a version of Spider-Man who wields Doctor Strange's cloak of levitation called Zombie Hunter Spider-Man, obviously during the Marvel Zombies episode. But they separate this episode into different sections just denoted by days of the week, like the whole episode plays out over the course of a single week of the early Marvel Phase 1 movies of Nick Fury getting ready to go around and recruit all the Avengers from their movies. So we start on Monday with Nick Fury giving his speech, there was an idea, that famous Avengers speech, and different characters including Nick Fury quote that same Avengers speech several times throughout the episode. It is Samuel L. Jackson coming to do the voice of Nick Fury. Most of the Marvel movie actors came back to do their voices. There were a couple that were different and I'll point them out. Black Widow obviously is not Scarlett Johansson. She didn't come back to do the voice, but it doesn't have anything to do with the lawsuit that she's in with Disney right now over the Black Widow movie. They recorded all this stuff a long time ago. So Scarlett did not come back to do Black Widow just because she didn't want to come back. Like she's done playing the character and that all happened long before she ever got into it with Marvel over the profits over Black Widow. It's just a coincidence that that happened right as this is happening. But they are picking up about midway through the plot of Iron Man 2 with them actually going to the donut shop to have the conversation with Tony Stark to get him on the team. Although even at the end of Iron Man 2 when he's looking at the Avengers initiative file, Nick Fury is still making it sound like, no, we don't really want you on the team. We just want you as a consultant. But it does help you place this in the timeline, and they're trying to connect all these early Marvel Phase 1 movies, Iron Man 2, Incredible Hulk, and the first Thor movie, all saying that this is happening within the span of a single week. The whole scene here from Iron Man 2 in the donut shop mostly plays out exactly the same, their conversation, until Black Widow doses him with the sedative and it winds up killing him. So RIP Iron Man, doesn't this feel familiar? The Watcher's narration speech talks about humanity being blind to the bigger picture. It's a very Loki-esque speech, something early Loki would have said during Marvel Phase 1. And it is meant to foreshadow some of the stuff that happens with Loki later in the episode, but obviously Hank Pym is the person who's behind all this, as he reveals later. But I do like the way they're using the Marvel characters, the Avengers characters, the events of the Avengers movies to tell this murder story. I don't think that we've done a story like this in Marvel before. The closest we've gotten to stories like this are the Captain America movies like Winter Soldier where they're more like thrillers where you are trying to solve a mystery, but that movie wasn't specifically a murder mystery. Then the Watcher narrates Iron Man's backstory through the events of Iron Man 2, sets up the Hulk storyline, and this is Marvel Phase 1, remember, so it's Mark Ruffalo coming back to do the Edward Norton version of the Incredible Hulk movie, which is surreal. Also, Thor's arrival on Earth, the events of the first Thor movie, at least up to the point where he tries to take the hammer. Then they do this funny thing where he basically narrates the story of them coming together. He narrates the plot of the Crucible, as he calls it, of the first Avengers movie. Them coming together, them being forged as heroes, becoming a team for the first time. You even see the scene of the Hulk thrashing Loki. They do the Avengers Assemble scene. 
But then they do the record drop joke thing, saying that, well, at least that's how things played out in one universe. A reference to the events of the Infinity Saga of movies, the sacred timeline version of things, the main MCU universe. But then setting off this whole murder mystery, where in this universe, someone, Hank Pym, we find out, goes around killing all the Avengers before they can actually become Avengers. Then the way they tell the story is sort of linear in the way that the Marvel movies played out in the timeline. So because the next thing that happened after this is you got the Iron Man 2 post credit scene with Thor's hammer, that's the next scene that they jump to, and it is Clark Gregg coming back to do the voice of Coulson for this. He shows up in that post credit scene moment, finding Thor's hammer, telling Nick Fury about it, just as Nick Fury is arresting Black Widow, or making it seem like he's arresting her. But they invoke a lot of energy from the Captain America Winter Soldier movie where he feels like somebody inside the system is trying to sabotage this. So he asks Black Widow to go rogue and find out what's going on. You notice that it's Crossbones and his crew who are arresting her. They're still Hydra secretly at this point. So then making a couple Winter Soldier references during this is very apropos. There's also a really big Winter Soldier connection to why Hope died in Odessa and why Hank is now going around killing all the Avengers, revenge killing them. I'll point that out when we get to that part of the episode. Crossbones reference Alexander Pierce saying that he's going to be questioning Black Widow back in New York. Alexander Pierce also secretly a Hydra agent inside S.H.I.E.L.D. They reference the Land of Punch joke from the Ant-Man movie, which is a Hope reference. Also, Hope, big part of the episode as well, because it's the whole reason why Hank Pym is going around killing everyone. But the punch joke is also a bit of a wink at the Black Widow happy joke from Iron Man 2, thinking that she couldn't fight because she was this model, she was an assistant, and her handing him his ass. While Crossbones is making all these references, she's busy knocking all the other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents out. Then they continue through the events of the first Thor movie, examining Thor's hammer. Hawkeye mentions Vita radiation. Vita rays were what they bombarded Captain America with to activate the super soldier serum in his body, and Captain Carter now too, because that was the same process. Then Thor shows up to try and lift his hammer, and just like before, events play out the same as they did in the first Thor movie, up to the point where he tries to lay hands on the hammer. Coulson makes all kinds of jokes about Thor being super good looking, his hair being amazing, Hawkeye makes the same references too, and then later, Coulson even sniffs his dead body on the table like, hmm, smells so good, trying to get high on Thor fumes. But just as he tries to lay his hand on the hammer, Hawkeye's arrow kills him, Hawkeye having no idea how it happened, only that he did not fire the arrow himself. And when Nick Fury goes to question him later in his closed cell, finds that he's dead. Obviously, later we find out that it was Hank Pym going around using the yellow jacket suit to go super small and kill all them stealth. Nick Fury references the Avengers speech again when Coulson says there wasn't a whole lot connecting a billionaire ploy boy and an assassin. Do you have any ideas? And it's a bit of a twist on the line. Nick Fury says there was an idea. It takes them a little while in the episode to find out that it's all the Avengers recruits that are being targeted by Hank Pym. But then because the events of the first Thor movie were taking place almost concurrently with the events of the Incredible Hulk movie, in the timeline at least, they start cross-cutting between the events of the Thor movie and the Incredible Hulk film. With Black Widow showing up on campus to talk to Betty Ross about Iron Man's death, asking for Betty's help just finding evidence with the injector, and then learning that Bruce Banner is sitting nearby. They do the Stan Lee reference, the Stan Lee pizza from the Incredible Hulk film. That was also the Lou Ferrigno cameo scene, but it's Stan Lee pizza as in Stan Lee, the comic book creator Stan Lee. Then out steps Mark Ruffalo as the Incredible Hulk. So remember, this is all supposed to be Edward Norton era Hulk stuff. So it's super surreal watching this play out. Talk about alternate timelines. Then when Coulson is driving back with the coffees, that's actually a reference to the one shot a funny thing happened on the way to Thor's hammer. If you remember the Marvel one shots from early in Marvel phase one and phase two, it's basically Coulson just going, stopping at a gas station to refill and then getting in this huge fight, revealing that he's a total badass, even though he seemed like the most normal person ever. So when he says he picked up a coffee for Nick Fury and he's coming back from that, that's what just happened. But just as he's driving back, you notice the silhouette of the Watcher across the landscape watching everything unfold as he narrated during the episode. And also, as he drives back to the base, to Thor's hammer, Loki shows up with the Bifrost, the entire Asgardian army, the Warriors 3, and the Destroyer ready to exact vengeance upon Earth for Thor's death. He gives the exact same speech from the early Marvel Phase 1 movies, announcing himself in the most grand way possible, but they play the cell phone joke with Nick Fury cutting him off, interrupting him several times, just taking the piss out of him a little bit. It's Black Widow calling him to tell him that they need help getting out because Thunderbolt Ross and the military have just rolled up, and it's the same version of that scene from The Incredible Hulk where he hulks out bursting through the glass walkway. 
Then in order to get the Hulk, Hank Pym makes it seem like one of Thunderbolt Ross's men shoots him, purposefully causing him to Hulk out. Then because this is all happening at the same time, they cross cut between Loki opening up on Nick Fury with the Cask of Ancient Winters and Hulk destroying everything on sight. The scene of Loki using the Cask of Ancient Winters is also very reminiscent, almost the exact same scene of his father Lofi doing it in the opening flashback scene of the first Thor movie when he was attacking humans living in that Tonsberg, Norway village. That was also the same village where they kept the test rack later in the same town where Odin died on the cliffs and the same town where they built new Asgard. We'll go back there during Thor Love and Thunder. But while Hulk is busy smashing the hell out of Thunderbolt Ross's men and all of his equipment, just as Betty is about to defuse the situation, Hank Pym uses his Pym particles to blow Hulk up from the inside out, killing the supposedly unkillable Hulk. If you thought it was weird why so many characters talked about the Hulk being unkillable in the episode, that was why they were setting this big twist up. Then Nick Fury makes his bargain with Loki to team up and find out who's killing everyone. Loki threatens to turn Earth, Midgard, into another version of Jotunheim basically if he doesn't find the killer, cover the entire planet in ice. They have that funny joke with Black Widow getting Coulson's password and it's just a big love letter to Captain America. Like it's a bunch of Captain Americas, then 0704 is a reference to July 4th, which was Steve Rogers, Captain America's birthday. She then makes the connection to Hope Van Dyne because in this reality, Hope Van Dyne became a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent so there's files on her, just as Hank Pym shows up to kill her, going super small to increase his strength. Then just as Nick Fury is figuring things out, piecing things together, Coulson makes the connection that he is the next target because he's part of the Avengers initiative. Like your name is on this list too. But when he says he's not the only Avengers left, that's obviously setting up the big Captain Marvel twist. He pulls out her souped up space pager from the Captain Marvel movie. And even though Coulson was in that movie as a younger rookie agent version of Coulson, Nick Fury never told him about the pager, which is why he's asking about it here. Like what, is that a beeper? Is this from the 90s? What's going on? The other callback with the Avengers initiative was, is that the name Avenger was Captain Marvel's call sign. So he got the idea for the Avengers initiative to protect Earth in case of a threat from outer space came because of what happened with the Kree. When he mentions the deal with the devil, that's because of Loki's horns, he has devil-like horns, and because he was a villain in the first Avengers movie, and he's kind of a villain during this episode, conquering Earth effectively, only with the tiniest bit of bloodshed this time. Love Nick Fury versus the Destroyer too when he shows up to tell Loki about his plan, asking for his help to deceive Hank Pym so that they can take him down. You got a name, soldier? And then they cut to Hope's gravestone in San Francisco with Hank Pym showing up in the yellow jacket suit, just looking like the darkest timeline version of himself. He explains everything, why he killed all the Avengers recruits because he wanted payback against S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury for Hope's death, thinking that they were responsible. And it is Michael Douglas coming back to do the voice of the character. There's a couple reasons why he's in the Yellow Jacket suit too. This is a reference to a couple big comic book things. The Yellow Jacket version of Hank Pym in the comics was the persona he was using, the name he was going by, during the era when he went really off the rails and became kind of a villain in the comics. When you hear about Hank Pym being a super big asshole, being abusive to Janet Van Dyne, physically abusing her in the comics, that was when he was Yellow Jacket. They made a couple references to that in the MCU movies, but they played it kind of light. They talk about his temper, quote unquote. That's a reference to comic book Hank Pym. In the MCU context of things, the yellow jacket suit was supposed to be the next level, most advanced version of the suit. The only reason why they weren't using it in the first Ant-Man movie is because he left his own company. So they explained that Hope Van Dyne died on a mission in Odessa, Ukraine, in this reality, she had become a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, but the Odessa connection to Winter Soldier is that this was a Black Widow mission that was intercepted by Winter Soldier. So this is the Captain America Winter Soldier movie connection because the Odessa mission was referenced by Black Widow during the Winter Soldier movie. So there was a mission that Black Widow went on in the late 2000s before the events of what's happening right here where her convoy was attacked by the Winter Soldier. She survived with a gunshot wound to the chest, but the engineer who was with her died. In the normal Marvel movie timeline of events, the main MCU universe, the person was just a nameless engineer, a nobody. But in this reality, they're basically saying that that engineer that died was Hope Van Dyne. He then also blames S.H.I.E.L.D. and Fury for the death of his wife, Janet Van Dyne, because at this point, he has not learned that Janet got stuck in the quantum realm and is still alive. 
there's actually a trailer shot from some of the what if trailers with someone stuck in the quantum realm so that could wind up being a version of hope or a version of janet then he gets his ass handed to him by nick fury who is in fact really loki just disguised as nick fury loki has a measure of super strength all asgardians all frost giants do heightened speed as well which is why he's able to punch the crap out of hank pym even when he goes tiny and jump over him without breaking his sweat like wow you're pretty spry for a guy with a corner office True to Loki fashion, he continues to taunt him. He's actually pretty nasty about it too, using his magic and illusions just to mess with Hank Pym. And it's the same Loki joke from the first Avengers movie, just making a ton of copies of himself. He does calm down a little bit when Nick Fury explains things to him, like they actually did care about Hope, they will remember and honor her memory, as the Asgardians are carting him off to presumably execute him for Thor's death. Then the funny thing here about Loki conquering Earth, like the big twist on the first Avengers movie, is that Loki just gets the idea to conquer Earth through diplomacy and the threat of annihilation. Like, he just sees an opportunity, like an easy layup, and he takes it. Like, oh, you know, while I'm here, why don't I just stay for a little while? Like, Earth without the Avengers, and at least without Captain Marvel as far as we know, has zero chance against the forces of Asgard. So when they show the United Nations scene of him giving his speech from the first Avengers movie, it's implied that all the nations of Earth just reluctantly agreed to his terms to take marching orders from him from now on. And he gives a twist on that same speech, you were made to be ruled, from the first Avengers movie. They did another really nice twist on that during Loki episode 1, but it was obviously a very different context. And as Nick Fury and Coulson mourn the Avengers, Nick Fury implies that he will find new heroes like this was an idea, but these weren't the only Avengers out there. Then it cuts to him inside the ship in the ice wiping off Captain America's shield just as Captain Marvel shows up. Because at this point in the timeline of the Marvel movies, they were just about to find Captain America, unthaw him, and then recruit him to the Avengers. So now Nick Fury has two captains, and in this reality, because it's the star on the shield and the ship in the ice, it's the normal Steve Rogers Captain America, not the Captain Carter version. Overall, I'll say it's an okay episode. It was fun to see them do a legit Avengers story, and there will be more of that in the future episodes. Like, as we go along in the episodes, they'll continue to get crazier and crazier and bigger and bigger. What if episode four, I believe, is supposed to be the Doctor Strange episode where we get a version of his origin story, but he winds up becoming super dark version of Doctor Strange. I know there are a lot of people that were watching the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer and Doctor Strange seemed kind of different during that he was acting a little bit strange. So people were wondering if maybe he's a darker version of the character or if there's something weird going on with him during the movie. I'll talk about that more when I do my full What If Episode 4 video and that'll post next week just like normal. There's a whole bunch of other stuff coming up. I've got a couple more Spider-Man bonus videos that I'll post this week. If you saw any Easter eggs that I didn't talk about during the video, just write them below in the comments. And I'll name a giveaway winner when I post my next big Marvel video. Click here for my full Spider-Man No Way Home trailer video and click here to re-watch the trailer a billion more times. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.